Hello and welcome to Broad Lane Leisure. My name is Adrian and I'm about to demonstrate the internal workings of a Coachman Acadia Extra Platinum 2021 model. I want you to imagine first off that we have set the vehicle up. Uh, we have got main supply, we have got uh, gas and we've got water already connected. The mains is actually generating 12 volt electrics because we haven't got an independent battery on this vehicle. But just for demonstration purposes, uh, we've set this vehicle up already. Um, the first area we're going to come to when uh, we are demonstrating is basically going to come straight to the consumer unit. And the first thing I want to establish is that we have got a main supply. And the way that we do that, we press this little blue button in here. When I do that, that lever will trip out and then I'm going to have to reset everything on the caravan because it's all working off the mains electric. So to reset it, we've established we have got a main supply. Turn the lever back on and that's the first thing there. And just to tell you what these are, these are called miniature circuit breakers. They're like a fuse down here where these fuses blow, you have to replace and they're 12 volts. This is mains electrics. If these fuses or MCBs trip, all that you do is take off the offending appliance that's caused it to trip, turn the levers back on again, and away you go, you've got your main supply back. If it's on a 12 volt side of stuff, then yes, the fuse blows. You have to take that fuse out and replace it with the, the correct fuse uh, ampage wise. It tells you on the top line here what the amp uh, of that fuse is, but you can see most of them are beige, so it's the uh, they're five amp. Red ones are 10 amp. A blue one is a 15 amp supply and the yellow ones are 20 amp supplies. Uh, but it does give you that on the wording above. And just below there, it tells you what it actually supplies within the vehicle. Right, I'll now move over to the uh, entrance door panel. So over to the uh, entrance door and we're coming to the 12 volt distribution panel. We've already got the, uh, the 12 volt supply turned on. And the way we can see that, if I hit and hold this battery symbol, you'll see that uh, the indicator increases. And the higher up the scale you go, the better the battery is. Well, I've already said we're actually using mains electrics. We haven't got a battery in, so uh, the mains charger is producing the 12 volts in here, and that's the reason why we've got it up on this very top green section. If it was just 12 volts, we should really only have that particular stripe uh, illuminated, and obviously the red and the two ambers. Um, turn on the lights in turn, internally inside the vehicle is this particular one. This is for your awning light on the outside of the vehicle. And I'll just do that very quickly so that you can see that that illuminates on the entrance door. Okay, so that's one way you can turn the awning light off, on and off. You can also do it off the uh, key fobs, which we'll demonstrate shortly. Uh, the symbol above is the tap symbol, and basically that's going to bring the water pump supply on. Um, I'll just make sure that's live by pressing it. And this symbol here has no reference whatsoever. Basically, it's for other vehicles uh, that fit this particular panel, but this has no relevance at all. This is uh, going to be the Audi system, but I'll demonstrate that shortly. And we'll just move on to where the 12 volt lights are turned on and off uh, independently. So we've got in the lounge area four spotlights. They are what we call touch sensitive spotlights. So as soon as you touch them, they're touch sensitive to your fingers. All you're doing is pressing the little uh, chrome dome. So the first time you turn it on, you get a background light. The second time you hit that same button, you get the full illumination. The next time you press it, it's completely off. And that's the same on all four spotlights that we see here. We have got spotlights into uh, the bedroom area as well, but they've got an additional uh, item on there, which are for USBs for charging mobile phones. So uh, in those particular spotlights, you'll see there's a couple of USB connections. So for the downlighters uh, here and the overhead locker lights, we've got individual switches located on the near side uh, corner panel. And this one will turn off the overhead locker lights. As you can see, and that's on both sides of the vehicle. And then the inner one is gonna do the downlighters, which is centrally located. Okay, so moving towards the kitchen area, we have a, a, a light underneath the lockers which is touch sensitive, as you can see. I'm just moving my hand across the actual light to turn it on and off, and that's that particular one. Um, and really, in this area that we've covered all the lights that we've got uh, available in the, in the kitchen and uh, lounge area. As we go through to the toilet compartment, which is located centrally in this vehicle, we've got a pull cord, which 
turns on all the lights available in centrally in the in the toilet compartment. As we move left and right, I'll come on the off side of the vehicle, coming through into the bedroom area. These are the spotlights I was referring to earlier and in our dealer special model that we have got. As you can see, we've got USBs located, ideal for charging mobile phones. Uh, and then on the headboard, well, it's not the headboard, it's the footboard really. This is where a TV would be positioned. Uh, we have got a main supply, we've got a 12 volt supply, and we've also got coax, and we do have provided the saddle bracket that goes onto that, that unit there. But we have got a double light switch underneath it. Uh, one is to turn off the bathroom lights, as you can see, so you can do it from inside the bedroom area, and the other one is to turn off the remaining lights in, uh, in the bedroom area. So that's all the uh, internal lights covered on this uh, particular Acadia. Okay, so moving on uh, to one additional light that's uh, externally, it's on the off side of the vehicle, and inside this overhead locker area, we've got a, a, a cap here with a switch on it, and that's to actually turn on what I call the service light on the outside of the vehicle. So it's almost like the awning light that you'll see on the near side. Uh, and it's there so that you can uh, illuminate the area where your battery is, your mains and your water connections are. So if you do have to go and change a barrel of water when it's dark, then uh, you can turn that particular light on. And it should illuminate that off side of the vehicle. But uh, I was going to bring back to reference to uh, the alarm and awning light. As I say, the awning light is mainly turned on and off by that particular switch, but I also can turn it on and off via the key fob operation here. And I'm coming down to, if I hold the key fob like so, I'm coming down to the uh, bottom right hand corner. And as I do that, I don't know if you can pan up to the door area again, you can see the awning light going on and off via that remote switch. I'll turn it off again. So, and when I arm or disarm the alarm, the awning light also comes on as an indication when I press either that button or this one. This is to arm the system, we get two beeps, I think. There's two beeps and the awning light has now come on again. I'll take that off and if I hit that one, we get three beeps and again the awning light has come on as an indication that you've either armed or, armed or deactivated the alarm system itself. This one is also to activate the alarm, uh, to set the alarm that is rather when I say activate to set the alarm and this only gives one beep because it's only got one operation and it's the tilt sensor. So if you've got a pet inside the vehicle uh, while you've gone out for a meal or something like that, uh, then basically you can still arm the caravan but the, what is protected then is the tilt sensor, not the passive infrared. The passive infrared is this little uh, white rectangular shape object uh, and that picks up movement with inside the caravan. So you, you're emitting that, that particular zone there, the PIR. And that's very quickly the Gemini Phantom alarm system. So over to the Pioneer stereo. Uh, to turn the system on, hit this source button here. Uh, I hope it comes live. There we go. Digital radio. It's updating the DAB list. So what it's now doing is just searching for all the um, digital signals. Uh, and it's programmed them into the system, so it ends up around about 100 of them all together. But it's just updating that particular part of the program. So I'll wait for that to do it quickly. There we go. So the volume button, obviously, just turning that down. If I wish to change from the DAB and I want to go onto a different uh, FM or something like that, or AUX, hit the source button again. Now I've got the radio working. And obviously I need to tune it in, so I'd uh, press that key, hopefully, to get the uh, increase. There we go, is it gonna go into something? Radio three. Okay, so there's radio three found. And if I wanted to store radio three, I could press and hold that button there until that becomes a solid symbol again. And that's now stored radio three into the stereo. Um, if I press source again, it brings it into uh, Bluetooth and Spotify and auxiliary. Now auxiliary means I can use a memory stick. So if I've got music downloaded onto a memory stick, I'll put it into that and that's using that connection there on auxiliary. Or if I've got an older iPhone where I've got a three and a half mil jack connection, uh, I could use a mobile phone.
phone with a umbilical cord, three and a half mil cord to go into that point there and that works on the auxiliary gain and I'll be using then my mobile phone via the cord connection. Other than that, yes, you can uh, Bluetooth uh, music into it should you wish to. And when I press and hold source, the whole radio system goes dull. Okay, and that's in an off position. And that's the very simple Pioneer system. Thank you. So we're going to move on to the under counter refrigerator. Uh, we've got it already turned on, as you can see, by the lights which are illuminated on the panel. This is the on-off button. Uh, it's touch sensitive, hopefully. And if you keep your finger on the on-off button, hopefully this, this will go off. There we go, finally got it to work. And turn it back on again, like so. It automatically goes back to the way it was last set up. So uh, I was working at full illumination, uh, which, sorry, not full illumination, full uh, freezer capacity. And I'd also got it set on auto, which means it prioritizes mains electrics. If mains isn't available, it would then move on to the gas supply to see if it could work off gas. And if you haven't got the gas supply turned on, it would then go to the battery side of things. And that is your tow vehicle battery, not your leisure vehicle battery. So the energy source for that when you, when you want to run it on battery is from the tow vehicle. If you wish to change the mode and you manually want to set it, if you hit the mode button here, uh, it now changes over to battery. And I've got an alarm system and an audible sound being given off because we haven't got the tow vehicle present. So if I want to override that, just press that button to hear one beep. That's the one beep, it's gone out, but it's gonna go back into alarm because we still haven't got that tow vehicle. So I'm gonna change the mode. I'm gonna come back onto gas, and this is manually operating it now. So we're not on the auto mode, we're on the manual mode, and this is now fully automatic. Uh, we don't have to do anything else, just let the refrigerator work by itself. Uh, so it's self-igniting is what I'm trying to say and if we wish to swap it back over to mains electrics it's that one there and now it's just working off mains electrics and if I wish to go back over to the auto mode just press that and it moves along as you can see along the panel indicating with the blue light below it what it's actually asking it to do to change them stat I've already done that's uh, for winter use that's for say spring and autumn that's the height of the summer now on this particular refrigerator, they've now changed the door operation on this particular system. So yes, you've got your just a pull door operation. You could also have it, if I bring it across, I've just brought a latch in use. So this is sort of for transit. So you can't just pull the door open now. I've got to push the latch over to pull the door open. If I wish to uh, move that latch out of the way, so I've just got it now like so, that's it. So I'll bring it back into play, and now it won't open unless I push the latch across. Okay, one of the small features you've got on there is this little arm that hidden underneath the uh, top fascia. And basically you bring it across, right across to the end, and that now keeps the door ajar, so it stops any mildew from building up and any uh, nasty smells that might occur if it's in a storage situation. So it keeps it ventilated is what I'm trying to say. And to return it back is just that. It doesn't open up from this side. You can have it in a left or a right hand format. So obviously, obviously everything like here changes over that way, uh, but that's if you wish to. And then you've also got another lock down the bottom, on the bottom of the door. Uh, it is just a lock. So it's nothing more than just a lock. So let's so see when I get it in the right position. <laughs> okay, uh, it's a drop down freezer box and you've got illumination there. So very quickly, the Dometic undercounter refrigerator fitted into the 2021 Coachman Acadia. Moving over to the cooker arrangement. Firstly, uh, you do need to have the glass lid raised. Um, also, I just uh, ask clients just to make sure periodically that they make sure these two little grub screws just on the bottom edge of the glass hob cover is, are tight. Uh, you can do it various ways. Uh, if you haven't got an actual screwdriver, because it's a flat blade screwdriver, you could use a pen knife like me, and you just rotate it slightly, but that is nice and tight. Uh, we have had a couple of these fly off, uh, not just in particular to Coachman Caravans, but uh, to other brands. So they do work loose in transit. So all I'm asking you is just make sure they're tight periodically. 
uh, just so that that lid doesn't fly off in transit. So fully raised when you're going to use the uh, any of the rings, gas rings, uh, or electric one, because we have got one electric ring here. Uh, and I've turned it right round to number six already, and it's warming up already, so that's nice. But you could go straight to number one if you wish to on the left-hand valve here, or leave it in the off position. If you find that you turn that on and you haven't got uh, any heat coming from this particular electric ring, the hob ring, then just come below to the uh, storage locker below, because in, located in here is a mains cable, and if I pull that plug out, which is that, there's a plug and socket, that now will, will not work. So sometimes uh, you can catch that lead when you're putting saucepans into this uh, storage locker underneath. Uh, I can't find where it's got to go now. I'm in working in the dark. So you just locate the plug back into the socket and then that's that part of the system ready for use again. You've got three gas rings, uh, all straightforward, and you've got electronic ignition. They're on high and low, as you can see. Uh, these two are going to be for these two valves over here. And then you've got the grill and you've got the oven. Uh, the grill door lowers down like so. And that's now ignited uh, and in full operation. And you've got your low settings and your high and your off. And then the oven, you do actually see physically the flame on this particular unit. Sometimes the flame's hidden, but on this particular one, you can see it quite nicely. If it's on, mm -hmm. yes it is. Okay, and then that's it, up and running. And that's the very simple operation of this uh, Thetford oven. Thank you. Okay, so over to the Russell Hobbs microwave. Um, it's a very simple system to use. It has got a plug and socket arrangement located in this overhead locker to the left hand side of the microwave. So do make sure that the plug and socket are connected. And if I press the start button, it increases it by 30 seconds. So the timer increases by 30 seconds, but it automatically starts to work. So there's 30 seconds and it's already counting down. If I wish to hold that timer for some reason, uh, I can just press the stop clear button once and it stops the timer from working. But if I want to start it again, just press the start button. Away she goes, counting down. If I want to clear that timer, press it for the second time on the stop button and now that clears the time uh, allocated on it. You can change the power level by hitting this button here. You can cut by wait time and defrost, etc., And you can put a clock and a timer on it. So very quickly, if I want to increase the time from 30 seconds to two minutes, hit it four times. There's the two minute counter away she goes. Uh, when you want to open up the uh, door, there's no button, it's just a pull handle. That's all straightforward. You can also change things on this particular uh, scroll button here by timing it different ways. This is now a timer at 95 minutes or 90 or counting it down and it decreases and comes in two minutes and then we're going to seconds, 30 seconds, and then we come down into five seconds or 10. There we go. Okay, so uh, we can do various bits there, we can select it at that and then just clear it. So several ways you can operate that particular microwave. Uh, obviously it comes with the full instructions as well and the glass plate uh, isn't present at the moment, but that would be uh, when we've sold the vehicle. So I'm now going to move over to the Omnivent. So the Omnivent is a, 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 roof, a roof vent basically. Um, and this little round button here, you rotate and it lifts the lens up into an open position. So that's just for standard ventilation, just natural ventilation taking place. We can have the benefit of a fan uh, and to turn the fan on is just to press the on off button. As you can see, we've got a nice bright light here on the on off section, but we only get a small dim light here. The fan speed's only working at half a revolution. And then we got to one. Then one and a half, two, two and a half, and three. And that's the maximum setting. And it's extracting air. So this is if it was cooking in the kitchen area and we want to exhaust some of the smells that's being generated, uh, then you can use it on an extraction. But we have the benefit also of being able to draw fresh air in from outside. Uh, so start the system again by pressing the on-off button. It's going to extract as it does every time. Stop it by pressing the opposite direction. So it's now only got the on off button illuminated. Press it again. There's the half rev. 
and then it goes into one, one and a half, two, two and a half, or three at your desired setting. And you turn it back off again, obviously it's going to slow down and eventually when we turn it back on it will always extract when you first turn it on. So there it is, it's going to always extract. If there's any chance of rain then I do recommend that you do lower the lens down um, because this is obviously an electric motor here, 12 volt electric motor. We don't really want to get any water onto that area. So if you can remember just to, uh, if there's any chance of rain, just lower the lens down so that you are covering the fan area. Uh, it does have a night blind, which is that in its operation. So you're just grabbing the two tags, keep them pressed in to move it back and forth. Okay, thank you. So we're just about to come into the kitchen area to get running water through uh, our kitchen tap. Um, we've got to do a couple of things first, obviously make sure that we've got a full container of water on the outside of the vehicle. So we're using an aqua roll. Uh, we are using also a pipe which connects into the side of the caravan. Uh, I'll show you that when we're on the outside. And then we drop the pump, physical pump, into the actual water barrel itself. Uh, once you've got that and established that connection, you come back inside the caravan, you come into the offside front seat area and you're going to find two drain down valves. They are of a yellow colour in nature and basically the valve needs to be with the, with the tap in a horizontal position. If you raise the handle and it's vertical, it's open, so any water coming straight into the system is being uh, extracted underneath the floor of the caravan. So the lever needs to be in a horizontal position, there's two of them. One is on the cold side and the other one is on the hot side. So located in that offside front corner underneath the bed area. Just go into there, make sure the two taps are closed. Also make sure that the taps are closed both in the vanity area and the shower and also the kitchen, make sure they're in a closed position. The next thing that we would do is turn on the water pump supply. So we're onto the control panel above the door, make sure you're hitting that tap symbol and I've hopefully got it turned on this time. Uh, move the kitchen tap to the cold position. And yes, we have got it turned on. <laughs> uh, what we want is a full flow of water, something like that, already established. Uh, we want it to be a constant flow to come without air in there. If we've established that, then I can turn it straight to the hot side. Because what we would be doing now is filling the onboard uh, hot water tank inside the Audi boiler itself. So you're going to put about two gallons of water into that boiler first before you start to get a flow of water out the hot tap. But once we've got the hot water, once we've got that flow, it is obviously cold at the moment because we haven't turned the boiler on. So once we've got that flow, as we've established there, turn the tap off. We don't need to bleed the rest of the system. I've established we've got water there. And then we come across to the Audi control switch itself. I'm going to turn this boiler off now. So that is the off position, as you can see. It's going to go blank. I'm going to turn it back on again for you. So I'm hitting the on off button. That just tells you a little bit about the boiler itself. We make it, where it's made. And then we come into a standby menu. And on the standby menu, uh, this screen's in a negative. So I'm going to just change that very quickly for you. Just so that I put it back to how it was. Because I've played around with it already. So when you first turn it on, it's going to be like that. So it's a clear screen, uh, quite bright. Uh, on this information, we've, we're learning that the internal uh, temperature is 21 degrees. And we have got a mains present. And also that the fluid, the antifreeze fluid that's uh, in the Audi boiler is being circulated around through the radiators. So that circle is to say it's been circulated, pumped around through the radiators and heating up the vehicle. If I hit the menu button, we come into a program side um, and we can see that we've asked it to reach 22 degrees. So at the moment it's on 21. So we're not almost built up to temperature already, but I could decrease that if I don't want it uh, at 22 degrees. And let's say we'll have it at 19 just for argument's sake. If I go back on the menu button again, I've just lost the circulation pump because we've reached the room thermostat. So if I go back and increase that temperature, I'm going to make it now 23 degrees and come back on the menu button. 
you'll see the circulation symbol has now reappeared because we've increased that thermostat above what we're at the room thermostat's already at, which is 21 and a half degrees. So we want it to get to 23 degrees now. So that's what we're asking there. This symbol, the next second symbol down, has got a shower head, but it's the one in the middle I'm more interested in. It's the triangle, because if you plus or minus it, you can see the triangle changes uh, from what you're asking it to do. Okay, so it's that that changes. Now I want the triangle, for me personally, this is how I use the system, and it's down to individuals how they use it. I prefer the triangle to be half shaded and half clear, which means it's doing both sides of the combi boiler i.e. it's doing central heating and hot water performance. If I've got it completely blacked out, shaded out, as we are now, we're only doing hot water, and that would stay on hot water system for half an hour. After half an hour, it does go back to that symbol there now, being half shaded and half clear. When you do it on the so fully clear, all that we've got is the operation of the boiler working on central heating only. It's not gonna produce hot water. Uh, the reason I know it's central heating is I've still got that circulation symbol. That's a very easy way of learning. If I make that completely dark and go back to it again, I've lost the circulation symbol. So, the way I use the boiler personally for myself, uh, I run it about 23 degrees personally. I always have uh, that triangle set so it's half shaded and half clear. And then if I've only got mains electrics available, well, if I've got mains electrics available, it's my choice whether I just use mains to heat the boiler. Uh, if I'm not using mains, it will be in an off position. So if I haven't got mains available to me, I've got to resort to gas, which is this symbol here. When it's green, it's live. And if it's blue like so, the gas supply is off. So I've also got mains off, as you can see, and I've got gas off now. Let's turn the mains on. That's one kilowatt. That's two kilowatts, and it has a maximum of three can't increase it above three kilowatts. That's if I'm on a site where I've got 16 amps available. Still might have some limitations as to what else I can use, but uh, I could use it at three kilowatts. If I'm on a site where I've only got two kilo uh, 10 kilowatts available, I'd work it at two kilowatts. Actually, sorry, I'm using the wrong terminology. Uh, it should be amps I'm referring to. So 16 amps or 10 amps. Uh, and if I'm on a site where I've only got five amps available, I'd be using that at one kilowatt. So just to repeat, that's one kilowatt, five amp supply, two kilowatt, 10 amp supply, three kilowatt is a 16 amp supply, but it's purely down to you as to what you ask it to work from. Again, for myself, I would use it at one kilowatt or two, and I would also use gas as a, a, a source as well. So when you've got both working at the same time, yes, on the initial heat up, you are using uh, both energy sources, but once it's built up to temperature, the gas side of the boiler actually shuts down. And if it can work just on mains alone and sustain the demand that you're putting on the boiler, it will just work on the one kilowatt. But if your demand's greater, and I'm just gonna say you've been out walking and you wanna come back and there's two of you, you both wish to have showers one after the other, then it may come in that the gas comes in a supporting role to aid the mains electrics. And that's a very simple use. Now, that's the way I use it personally. Um, some people don't like to use the gas, so they'll just use it on mains electrics alone. It's down to the individuals. It's down to how you want it to be. This little symbol here says ACC on it. It's air conditioning, and uh, we haven't got that available, so that's the reason why it's shaded in grey. If I come to that, you can see also see that I haven't got that available. It's not, uh, it's not illuminated. But any of the other five options on this particular settings button, we've got four menus here, uh, which I'll go through very quickly. This is this symbol here is this fascia clock here. And what I did was change it from bright, which is the standard factory set to invert. And what it changes is not that panel, but this panel here, it makes it go into a negative screen. So you're not getting a bright illumination, especially at night time. So uh, it's not it's not illuminating all this area up and keeping everybody awake at night. So that's what that symbol does. Oops that symbol there. This one's to put a timer on it uh, and we can set the time of the date. So today is Monday for instance and I'll just quickly put one minute on it. If I wanted to show it on the front face, I ask it to show, come back off there, not there, but it is here. 
Monday, and it's one minute on the timer. There's the clock. Well, I could also take that out if I don't want that. So let me just show you how to take it out. Got on the clock. Don't show on the front face. There it is. Uh, I could minus that down, for instance, and there we go. Not available again. So this is to prioritize between mains, electrics, or gas. Uh, factory set is mains, but you could prioritize it to work off gas if you wish to. So you have the reverse of what I was saying earlier, where it does work off both energy sources if, uh, if you have them turned on. Uh, once it's heated up to temperature, the gas side of it shuts down. Well, if you prioritize gas, it has the uh, opposite effect. The main side of it will then shut down, uh, just leaving it working on gas. But that's what it's set at, and that's factory set, and that's how I would leave that with the zigzag in it. The next one after that is uh, a daytime setting and a nighttime setting. So once you've established the clock, you can have a different uh, temperature during the day to what you have in the evening. Uh, and you can program that uh, for five days a week, seven days a week, individual days, whatever you want it to be. So personally, I never bother. Um, all I do, if I don't want the heating on, I lower the thermostat down. So going to bed at night time, I'd never have the central heating on, but I want it there just in case it gets really nippy at night. So I'll put it on 15 degrees is typically what I use, leave it at. And then if I get up in the morning, it's still a bit chilly in the caravan when I first get up, I then just increase the thermostat. And that's how I run my boiler. But that's just me personally again. You don't have to do it that way. You can, if you want to put timers on, you can. So going back into settings one more time. Nothing available on menu number two. On menu number three, all that I'm interested in is the top three symbols. The first one is if we're in a mountain range. Now I'm on about if we're in the Alps or the Pyrenees. Um, we hit that and we it says on here, high altitude mode, only for use at altitudes above a thousand meters. So first off, the site's got to be at a high altitude. Um, so if anything above a thousand meters, uh, then you want the boiler turning on. Because the oxygen's that much thinner, uh, you need to have, there's a fan built into the boiler, which uh, increases the airflow. Oops, let's get that. Come on. Uh, so menu number two, nothing available. Menu number three is the mountain symbol. This is so that you can offset a thermostat. Uh, now in this caravan makeup, I've got to change my fingers. Uh, in this caravan makeup, we've only got the one thermostat. Uh, but sometimes when uh, other vehicles, we do get a thermostat on the actual control panel and clients say, well, why is this thermostat not mirroring that thermostat? It's because they're located in different locations. And so that you can get the two temperatures so they read about the same, you can plus or minus increase or decrease the actual uh, centigrade setting uh, in the caravan on the Audi boiler. So to show you again what it is, thermostat. There it is, decrease it. You can go up to minus five, so you can offset it by minus five degrees on this boiler, or you could increase it by five, but I'll only leave it at zero. There. And then the very last symbol is uh, a symbol that you can use for killing the Janella. Um, so it's mainly if you go on the continent for three months of the year, uh, i.e. over the winter period, a lot of people do do that these days. Um, lucky devils. Uh, I'm waiting for my boss to volunteer me to do that. Uh, but uh, no, if you're away for three months, then perhaps you might want to uh, turn that symbol on there. It operates the boiler at higher temperatures for a 24 hour period. We tend to run the boiler on that when it comes in for service work, just to make sure that you know it is done once a year. But it's just something, if you are away for a longer period, then I'd recommend that at some stage during your stay, you're, a, you're away for three months, then just operate that boiler at that uh, on that Legionella, which is that symbol there. These ones are still for operation, more for ourselves uh, as service engineers, so I'm gonna not leave those if I may. And then the last one I want to show you is just the reset button. You can change the language should you wish to uh, test yourself. I personally wouldn't leave it in English. Um, and then if you want to reset it, you can do that. It asks you, do you wish to reset the system? You press it again to confirm it, or you just come straight back out of it again, whichever way you want to do it. And that is the Audi boiler in a very simple format.
hopefully you found that to, to be useful information. Thank you. So moving in onto the Thetford toilet, cassette toilet. Uh, basically it's a swivel bowl toilet so you can rotate that to make it more comfortable to where you want it to be so you're not catching your knees on this uh, vanity basin thread opposite for instance. Uh, obviously I'm not going to give you a full demonstration uh, but I want you to imagine that we've already filled this tank up with fresh water. We haven't but imagine there's fresh water in that particular tank. That's for flushing purposes. The bottom tank is a cassette and that's where all your waste uh, gets emptied into. So basically, here's the toilet. You flush it by pressing the blue button. There's the noise, which would be a lot quieter if we got uh, water in there. It's obviously noisy because we've got nothing deadening that uh, pump noise. But water circulates around the bowl. When you're ready to dispense the waste, you come to the lever on the front face and you're moving it backwards, like so. And what that does is move the blade, the trap, so all the uh, waste drops into your holding tank below. That's, uh, that's how you use the loo, for instance. There is a little small symbol here, which does illuminate when the bottom cassette is almost full. It's about an inch off the top, so if you're just using it overnight before you uh, move on for, with your travels, then that's fine. You could probably get away with it, but if you're gonna use, stay there for a bit longer, then I recommend that's the time to go and empty it because it's almost full. Uh, your fresh water, you can put pink chemical into. Uh, called aqua rinse and that just keeps the water smelling nice it's uh, swimming around the bowl helps keep the bowl clean and in the holding tank below the cassette you can put a blue or green chemical aqua chem uh, or other variants uh, which are available and uh, say so you, you uh, gain access to these externally on the outside of the caravan we'll cover that when we just go around the outside of the vehicle so that's for how you use that particular appliance Thank you. So I just want to show you the location of the reservoir that's on the Audi boiler system. So it's fitted into the offside rear corner of this particular caravan arrangement, so in the wardrobe. And it's a pink fluid, as you can see. Uh, you can't really see too much in there, so I'd recommend that you do look at the uh, probably other videos that we've got on this vehicle, uh, because you can't really see too much in there at the moment. But that's where the reservoir is. You fill it up, you top it up from uh, periodically because it, it's a product that does evaporate. And the way you top it up is just remove that cap there. So see, pour the chemical into there that you need to. Seal it back up again. And you only fill it, now this is when it's cold, not when it's warm, because now it's warm and in use, it's actually uh, increased in its density. So what you'd normally do is have it roughly about the top of my finger here, where my fingernail is right now, about that level there. So it's increased by about two centimetres. So if you just have it, and say roughly a centimetre above the minimum level when it's cold, that's how much fluid you put into there. It's a pink chemical, which is a five year solution uh, by Audi. Uh, you can use the Audi product itself, or you could use an alternative, which is the G13 compatible uh, for aluminium use. Uh, you can buy that from places like Halfords or car accessory shops, but it wants to be uh, a five year solution, which is what that pink fluid is. If you are uh, going to buy the Halfords product, you just need to make sure that it is a five year solution that you are going to be putting into the uh, into that header tank. Otherwise you're diluting that particular product. So for me, I would always use the Audi products. Uh, you can get them from caravan accessory shops uh, or dealers like ourselves. Um, so I wish you all the best with that. Thank you. So we finished the demonstration of the internal workings of this Coachman Acadia uh, and we're now going to go on to the outside of the vehicle and I'll show you where some of the services are attached and uh, some of the functions that are on the outside of the vehicle. Thank you. So on the outside of the vehicle, um, I'm just going to draw your attention to this particular key. It's what we call a flip key. Uh, so you just press a button in there to get it to open up. So I'll just retract it, which is that, and then just press the button, it extends. Um, it's a high security key, uh, the key goes in like so, and that's to open it, so let's go again. Turn it anti-clockwise, from vertical to horizontal, back to the vertical, and that is locked. Put the key in again, turn it clockwise, back to the, from the horizontal to the vertical, and that's now open. When you're on the inside, if you wish to lock the door, you raise the handle like so, that's locked, and to open it, you lower it down like so. 
so you've got full use of the door. Uh, it's a one key operation on the whole of this system, so every lock on the caravan is operated just off that particular key, which is quite nice. You know, I've got various other ones in there. Uh, obviously, the key fob would normally be attached, and just to demonstrate this particular alarm system again and how to turn on this awning light externally, it's the bottom right hand system. As you can see, the awning light's illuminated, and I can turn it on and off. And if I arm the alarm, Two beeps, the awning light comes on for 30 seconds. I'm going to take that off now. And if I deactivate the alarm, again, it comes on with three beeps and I can turn that awning light off again if I wish to. So put the key into what is the outside uh, locker. So it's just gaining access underneath the near side front uh, seating area. You have got another access door coming from the side. Immediately as you go through the door, there's a drop down flap which you can gain access to the bed box that way uh, and then just raise that up rotate the key from through 180 degrees so that's to open it and that's to lock it and then all these additional little caps all slide up as you can see one is for the barbecue point and it's got the chrome nozzle attached by a cable tie that little nozzle there would go into this brass union here it fixes in as you push it in and then that would allow you to rotate the tap if the nozzle's not in place that tap will not open it will not turn the supply on so that's the barbecue point just slide that down this one i'll just take the flap off if i can take it off there it goes and that then shows you that it's a 230 main socket just located on the outside for outside use put the flap back in place and that just slides back down again now i have got gas supply on in here So it's a gas strut which keeps the door open, gives us good access uh, to the gas lockers and uh, to the gas containers. And there's two that you can have normally, one in this uh, on this bracket system and another one on this bracket system here. Comes with a hose tail, what we call a pigtail. Uh, and basically that's connected to the cylinder and you turn the supply on and off on top of the bottle, of course. I'll leave that live for a moment. With our dealer specials, and it's our dealer special variant I'm referring to, we do get a wheel clamp. It's an Alco wheel clamp. It's a sole secure product. Uh, they're normally a sealed bag, as you can see. And uh, normally the dealerships won't open those up because uh, there's uh, delicate information there. It's basically, it's got keys in there that we don't want to know what the numbers are. Uh, you have to register that independently uh, after you've purchased the vehicle with Alco directly. Uh, and they'll supply you with replacement keys should you need to. Uh, dealers can't get them, uh, so please uh, refer back to Alco on that should you need to. Just going to close the door up again. Use that one. Uh, over here, several bits and pieces. This is the stabiliser, and that's the action you use to engage the stabiliser. So the lever arm is completely down. When you come to engage it and you're lowering it down, you start to feel pressure between the green and the red points there. So long as you've got pressure being applied at that point, you're going to have sufficient pressure from the pads being applied onto the tow ball. Uh, when I say pads, there's four of them. There's one either side, one at the front and one at the rear. When the ball engages, uh, or to get it to couple it to go out onto the back of a car, this lever needs to be upright. When the ball enters into the coupling head and engages that handle shoots down like so to indicate that it's now got the ball and it's gripped in place that's your stabilizer action going on so that's a stabilizer there's another pro product here on the front a-frame cover called atc active trailer control made by alco the chassis people and basically it's an electronic braking system it senses if the back of the vehicle starts to sway uh, so say you're overtaking something on a motorway, a lorry say, the air displacement causes the back end to step out slightly and causes it to go into a bit of a snake. The ATC senses that movement and then it electronically applies the brakes uh, in the drums, pulls the caravan straight and then once it's got it vehicle under control, you don't notice this happening. Uh, basically then the brakes release and you carry on with your journey and everybody's safe. Uh, the handbrake uh, for engagement is basically either pull or, or push against it. As you can see, it's got a spring located in that 
so it's just a simple operation. No button to press in like you do on a handbrake on a car. Old fashioned, of course. Uh, so, mine's well, electronic. That's it, right? <laughs> uh, so over into this locker here, uh, that's just for storage. And if I open it up, you're gonna see all the uh, bits and pieces. I will open it up. Because you are gonna find that when you buy a new caravan, you get two key fobs, for instance, because there's a second key fob in here. There's one, there's the second one. Uh, it comes with the radio, uh, it comes with mains cables, it comes with various bits and pieces, obviously drill pan, and that's where, unfortunately, we just uh, pull everything out of the way for the time being, so you're seeing it just in the raw. Uh, just got to make sure that when you put these back, you get them in the right location. And it's 180 degree turn that you operate those keys with a lot. That's your Audi combination boiler, combi boiler, and that's just a balanced flue. So that's just where the gases and air gets taken into the boiler itself. This is your service light that I mentioned. And obviously we've got it illuminated. And immediately above it on the roof, you can see the aerial that we've been using for radio reception. And then just down from there, we've got the water pump connection. So uh, this is what the service light's for, so you can illuminate this area up. The pump itself, is at the bottom end of this pipe, as you can see. Uh, to remove it, you lift the flap up and then you just pull that connection out, as you can see. To pull it back in, put that in first, into there, drop that into your barrel, and then you just put the cap over the top just to make sure it seals properly. Uh, when you push that down, you've locked it in. You have to lift it up to pull that out. Okay. And that's made by a company called Whale, as you can see, all the name on the outside, Whale. This is now going to gain access to the battery box area and also the mains coupling. So this is where the battery would be housed. Uh, we haven't got a battery on as I've indicated already, uh, but these are bolt-on terminals. Uh, that's the positive and then you've got the negative over here. Uh, but because we've got main supply working on this vehicle, everything is working inside by the mains electrics and the charger. Uh, what I don't want to do is take this lead out when it's live. You should always remove the supply from the main supply first. Uh, so you don't want normally take this out with, when it's turned on. But I want to reveal, if I can, the two coaxial points there. One is a coax for outside use, which is this one. So at certain sites you go to around the country, you do find that they can supply you a, a coaxial uh, connection that you couple up to and basically that would improve the signal if you're in a very poor reception area. And then this one is for an outside satellite use. It's an F connector, it's got a screw on thread. And that screw on thread is for satellite uh, supply. And again, that's something that you would own yourself. You turn that key through 180 degrees, remove it, that's that lock. These are refrigerator vents. I'm not gonna tell you anything about those, uh, but this is where the toilet is. So these are the two tanks that we have on the toilet. This is the filling point. Uh, I use a separate nine liter, uh, sorry, 10 liter water container, and I pour water into here using the 10 liter container. I can put pink chemical in there if I wish to. Uh, so everybody's, everybody does, uh, but it's down to the individual should you wish to use that pink chemical or not. And then into the housing area below, which is the cassette, push the two locks in, door lowers down like so and to gain take the air cassette out you're lifting the orange handle up and then you're pulling it out uh, and extracting it out completely now normally this would have a cap on here uh, a measuring cap which you can measure the chemical that you need to go into the holding tank uh, to break down uh, uh, to break down the ablutions and also toilet uh, paper and things like that all right so you put in cap back on in place as such take that to your waste disposal point your chemical disposal point turn the funnel around to a 45 degree angle remove the cap and hold it like so as you press the orange button in there you do that rotate it like so and then any water would come out of the funnel at the end there it's upside down so it'll be that way that's the lowest point now well you're also at the chemical disposal point They'll provide you with the hose pipe normally, so you can swirl this around. So you open the blade up like so. Swirl the hose pipe around the internal mechanisms. Uh, there's a float mechanism down here, so make sure there's no toilet tissue still uh, remaining on that float. Otherwise, 
that the indicator doesn't work on the inside. Seal it back up again. That's the position it should be for when it's going back into the housing area. Make sure the handle's locked in place. Yeah, so that's ready for use. And then just above is just a, a drainage tube, which is to take water out of the flush, flush tank. So you pinch the pipe, pull the bung out, open the pipe up, and any residue water that's in there will run out here. I actually capture that back into that 10 litre water container because I'm uh, very stingy and I like to reuse that uh, chemical if it's surface to requirements rather than just let it run onto the floor. So that's the cassette and then we've got on the outlets we've got two of them located on the off side. This one is from both the vanity basin and also the uh, kitchen bowl. Uh, area so that's from the kitchen sink and the safe of the vanity basin this particular one is from the shower tray only so on the near side there's a couple of things just on the near side i want to point out to you first off we've got a spare wheel carrier located underneath which is uh, clamped to the chassis itself what you need to do if you have a deflated tire you need to uh, gain access to this uh, to this clamp so you remove the chain and then that allows you to rotate that nut, take the nut completely off, and then basically you grab both handles and you lift and you pull the spare wheel out on the telescopic arms uh, and bring the spare wheel so it's used in an easier access point here. Undo the two nuts that are on there, take the spare wheel out, and then obviously change the uh, affected tyre. Obviously you can put that uh, tyre back onto the cradle and then you push it back in place, put the black nut in place, Tighten it up and then you just put that little split pin back in place like so. So that's where the spare wheel is located. The only other thing I need to point out is the door retainer. So when the door's back, it locks into a bracket here to release that. You need to press that trigger like so. So that's locked, press it, release it. And finally, uh, on the outside of this vehicle, we're just coming down to the data plate and this tells us that we've got a coachman it's an acadia 545 this fin number is that one on this particular one and the maximum that we can load it to is 1600 below now this is a 1700 kilogram axle so if you wanted to increase the weight because you're having movers fitted to it or something like that where you've got additional equipment going on and you wish to have a higher maximum uh, load then you can increase it to 1700 on this particular arrangement and then just further on down here, it gives you the tire inflation pressure and it gives you also that we tighten the wheel nuts up to 130 newton meters. It's on an alloy wheel and uh, they're tightened up to 130 newton meters. So I hope you found the information contained within this video to be useful and I thank you very much for your time.